Socrates is said to have been the first who called philosophy down from heaven and forced it to make inquiries about life and manners and good and bad things. Page 120. His study of human things consisted in raising the question, what is, in regard to those things? For instance, the question, what is courage? More generally, he tried, as Strauss writes, to grasp the distinctive character of human things as such, which he could not do without grasping the essential difference between human things and the divine or natural things. In other words, to understand what the human things are depends on a comprehensive study of all things, including divine and natural things. Because otherwise, how are you going to know what is specifically human if you don't know the limits and what stands at either end of them. What Strauss says next on pages 122 and 123 in the reading is, in my opinion, especially important. Strauss says that for Socrates, the science of the whole, or of everything that is, consists of understanding what each of the beings is. For to be means to be something, and hence to be different from things which are something else. To be means, therefore, to be a part. Let me put it this way. What does philosophy seek in seeking knowledge of the whole? It seeks knowledge of the parts because the whole is the totality of the parts. It does not seek to know primarily the origin or that from which the parts have come into being. The thing itself, as Strauss puts it, the completed thing, cannot be understood as a product of the process leading up to it. You can't understand the completed thing as a product of the process. But on the contrary, the process cannot be understood except in light of the completed thing or the end of the process. So very important, taking his bearings by the completed finished product and not by the process. You can't reduce the thing to its origin, to its genesis or to its coming into being. In other words, we seek knowledge of the parts and we know the parts with reference to the shape, form, character, essence, or idea, not with respect to their origin, genesis, or process. Two very different approaches here to what it means to know the whole and what it means to know a thing. Knowledge of the whole is not knowledge of, quote, the roots out of which the completed whole has grown. And Socratic philosophy, at least, does not seek to perceive the unity which is hidden behind the variety of things or appearances. Rather, it wants to understand the unity that is revealed in the manifest articulation of the completed whole, page 123. So not the hidden unity behind all things, but the manifest, non-hidden, open, articulation, multiplicity, diversity, of the completed whole, not of the hidden origin. Socratic philosophy takes its bearings by what Strauss has elsewhere called noetic heterogeneity, by the articulated whole which makes possible several distinct sciences. You have to see that the contrast here is with an understanding of philosophy that does seek for the root from which everything has emerged, or that does try to find a hidden unity behind the differences and distinctions. Now, why is this so important for Strauss? I think that the very next sentence in this section gives us a big hint. Socrates, he writes, seems to have regarded the change which he brought about. Now that means the change from seeking the roots and the hidden unity to seeking the whole through knowledge of the parts, through asking what is about these various parts and what we've said. Socrates seems to have regarded that change, quote, as a return to sobriety and moderation from the madness of his predecessors. In contradistinction to his predecessors, Strauss says, he did not separate wisdom from moderation. Now, I'm going to return to that line in a second, but let's finish Strauss's thought here first. In present day parlance, he writes, 
One can describe the change in question as a return to common sense or to the world of common sense. Since the idea or character of a thing is primarily that which is visible to all without any particular effort, or what one might call the surface of things, as opposed to, remember, as opposed to the hidden unity, the manifest surface division, multiplicity, heterogeneity. Socrates started not from what is first in itself or first by nature, but from what is first for us, from what comes to sight first. And what comes to sight first about beings, Strauss says, is not what we see of them, but what is said about them or in opinions about them. Accordingly, page 124, Socrates started in his understanding of the natures of things from the opinions about their natures. Now, there is so much to say about this passage, and I have to limit myself to a few brief points before we return to the issue of how Socratic natural right differs from philosophic conventionalism, which is where we left off at the end of the previous chapter. But first, it's absolutely crucial that Strauss says Socrates' understanding of philosophy did not separate moderation from wisdom. You will remember that in what is political philosophy, in the discussion about Plato's laws, moderation was a notion of the greatest importance. And let me just remind you of that. On page 32 of that reading, Strauss said that when the philosopher limits his own horizon for the sake of the law, that this obfuscation, this acceptance of the political perspective, this achievement of harmony between wisdom and law abidingness, is, it seems, the most noble exercise of the virtue of moderation. In On Tyranny, Strauss effectively says that the primary difference between Xenophon and Machiavelli, or between classical or Socratic and modern political thought, is that Xenophon did not, and Machiavelli did, separate wisdom from moderation. Personally, if you were to ask me, to sum up all of Leo Strauss's teachings in a single sentence, it would have to do something with the combination of wisdom and moderation. But if we turn back to natural right in history, what do we find? We find that keeping moderation and wisdom together has something to do with seeing the whole in terms of its parts, in terms of heterogeneity. There's a relationship between moderation on one hand and orientation towards the characters, forms, or ideas of things on the other. There is more to that point than we can discuss now. I mean, Socrates' return to sobriety from the madness of his predecessors. You can think not only about his predecessors, but also about those of our contemporaries who seek to return to the pre-Socratic approach. Now, I just said we're not going to get into details. I only want to indicate for you that there's something here worth having a second and third look at, which is really true of the whole book, but somehow of these passages in particular. The other important notion from the passage I read is that initially beings come to light for us in terms of what is said about them, in terms of the opinions that people hold about them, which is why the study of the things that are, of the beings, must pass dialectically through the realm of opinion. Opinion is how we have access to them. We saw in other writings Strauss's argument that opinion is the element of society and that in questioning opinions and trying to transform them into knowledge, the philosopher may in effect undermine society's basic beliefs and therefore incur its wrath. We have not yet seen, however, as clearly as he indicates in this passage, that opinion is the being of beings for us in our everydayness. That what things are for us is what is said about them. That there's this intimate connection between what is said and what shows itself. Opinions are not worthless. Just like the shadows on the wall of the cave in Plato's Republic are not nothing. They reflect something, however dimly, and they are indispensable not only for their political function, 
but as an occasion for discursive reflection on what is true. This is precisely what conventionalism fails to grasp. As Strauss puts it, conventionalism disregards the understanding embodied in opinion and appeals from opinion to nature. Socrates, by contrast, did not disregard the understanding embodied in opinion. His classical natural right teaching, Strauss argues, does appeal to nature, but it does so in order to meet the conventionalists on their own grounds. Yet by page 146, at the end of this argument, Strauss shows that we can't discuss the perfection of our nature with reference to facts, but must have recourse to speeches or opinions, to what, to what is said about natural right. To recapitulate the argument so far, Socrates brought philosophy down from heaven to inquire about the human things. He couldn't inquire about the human things without understanding the human dimension in contradistinction to what is not human, in particular to the natural and the divine. Therefore, he had to seek comprehensive knowledge, knowledge of the whole, in order to grasp the specific character of the human things. His knowledge of the whole consisted of knowledge of the many parts, which he regarded as a return to sobriety when compared with the pre-Socratics who sought knowledge of the root or origin of all things. Socrates accessed the being of the parts through what was said about them, 